across the board missed a question. There's something wrong with that question. Right, right, right. Those are the things we go back and try to rewrite and clean up. Yeah, when Claudia was there, uh, she had asked me to take a look at mod one. She'd sent me the copies of the test at home there just to go. look at and to, she said, write a couple <coughs> new questions yep. and uh, send them. I don't know if they've ever got were accepted. And I wrote a couple more questions and stuff. I don't Good. know if we put them in or not, but, uh, yep. but that was, that's been about eight years, nine years ago and stuff. So. Yeah, and that's about when she left and Farrah came around. Yeah. And Farrah built a steel reinforced concrete <clears throat> wall between instructors and the test database. Yeah. A bunker. A bunker. Okay, yeah, Dave. I guess, huh? I guess our, our annual meetings are a thing of the past now. Looks like it. Looks like it. Looks like you got a full house, Dave. Rodney, you ready to go or? Uh, yes, sir. Just wanted to mention an, an admin note for the class. Um, oh, okay. And and I know, you know, because of the the extenuating circumstances of not having the books, um, I'm going to I'm looking at the schedule right now, and for next week. Uh, we schedule Monday and Tuesday to be the test taking days, but it's extended to Wednesday and also Friday. Um, so if you still are looking to take the test, you can schedule it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Friday. Um, and then also um, for the week of the 29th through the 1st of April, that's the Palmy Light week. Um, if you have taken Palmy before, uh, this is just literally the light version of it. So if you've taken Palmy before, you can also utilize that week to schedule your test. Um, and also for our DLA week, which starts, we have travel days, um, Sunday, and then we'll be there on Monday and then uh, it's going to be one day this time, so Tuesday and Wednesday. So um, Monday is going to be DLA, and then Tuesday, which will be uh, the 5th and the 6th. The 5th and the 6th of April is also a day that you can schedule the test. So we just wanted to mention those dates just to, you know, if you're still, you know, very serious about taking the test to give you that those options to do so um, in in light of the fact that, you know, the books may be coming a little later. Uh, any any questions on on those? And if I could jump in real quick, so the DLA day is going to be that Tuesday. So um, if you want to schedule it for Monday, you got that free day on Monday. And that would be, let me give you the actual day. Monday the 4th will be open. Because DLA will be virtual. Thank you for that. Um, not hearing any questions. I think we're up and good, sir. Um, floor is yours. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm glad you mentioned the test. I, <clears throat> I was actually going to talk about that uh, just briefly this before we get back into the material. I was thinking about, um, you know, what was what been said. I don't know who all is in the audience and how uh, you know what the plans are for taking the test. I'll, you know, we always recommend I would you know to schedule the test as soon as possible. And when we say that, I mean you know it'd be great if 
can take it the next day or the next week and stuff, but sometimes uh, because of availability at Pearson View or whatever, you can't do that. Um, what we're saying is don't wait six months, okay? Uh, this stuff, as Rich mentioned on the first day, this stuff is, it has a shelf life. And so it's falling out of your ears uh, as, as the day goes on and stuff. There's a lot of information here. Um, so if you can't take the test for a couple of weeks, that, you know, um, that gives you time to study. And um, my recommendations always to the, you know, when we teach this, uh, if you're serious about doing this, taking the exam, and I, and I highly recommend folks trying to get the CDFM exam, if you're in the financial arena, uh, this certification is what I call a discriminator. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great thing to have on your resume. And when you're applying for jobs, uh, this, this is one of those things that can, if you're, you're in competition with someone else and you have a CDFM and they don't, uh, this is going to be one of those things that sway the decision on who to select. Um, I think it was about uh, six or seven years ago, Rich and I, uh, we taught this course up at Booz Allen in Crystal City. And um, the audience was all contractors. Uh, Booz Allen does, you know, it's one of those Bellway Bandits. They do so much work with the government that they wanted the folks that are working on DOD contracts to uh, be knowledgeable the DOD processes and some of the things we talk about, you know, that we have talked about this week. So we taught the class to a whole bunch of young people um, that they never worked a day in their life in the government, but they working on DOD audits and things like that, helping, you know, some of the, the major commands in, in their clean audit efforts. And so um, it, it's, it's really an important certificate to have. Um, so if you can't, you know, schedule a test, you know, next week or whatever, uh, my, my recommendation always is register for the program. If you're serious about this, register for the program. And Rich said, you know, it's that's seventy-five dollars. I think if you're not not a member of ASMC, I think it's forty. If you are, pay your money, and that gets you into the program. That then it, it's like an initiation fee, and what that allows you to do is ha you have two years then to take the three modules, okay? Uh, and so after you register, you get your candidate ID number, I recommend scheduling a test and paying your money, okay? Why? Because now you have some skin in the game. You're gonna study a lot harder. You're gonna study a lot harder for that. So even if it's a couple of weeks out, schedule it. And then, uh, you know, we've covered a lot of information this week. Um, also, I, rec I recommend don't try to memorize this stuff, okay? You need to understand it. Uh, we said that the questions that are asked are uh, what they call thought-provoking, thought-provoking. So when you get your books, and those of you that have books, you have these knowledge checks after every competency. Uh, the questions on the exam are not at all like the knowledge checks but you need to understand the material. Sometimes you have to link a couple things together to come to the right answer, okay? So, but you, so um, you gotta understand it. Don't try to memorize, way too much information to try to uh, memorize. And uh, also when you're taking the exam, I, you know, I, I told you on Monday, uh, read the questions carefully, read the answers carefully, and for one word can make, or make a big difference. And then work through them by process of elimination. You can always eliminate, uh, for the most part, two of the four answers. And then sometimes your answer is the better of the two, the two remaining ones. Um, also, don't, and they, they teach you this when you take CPA exams and other things, don't try, don't overanalyze. You, you can talk yourself out of answering the, the right question. Work through these things, think about it, and then, you know, answer it. Don't, don't overanalyze. Uh, also, when you're taking the exam, uh, taking it on a computer, they have this nice feature called bookmarking. Bookmarking. So let's say you come to a question and you're not quite sure of the answer. You can just say bookmark it, okay, and then go on to the next question. And then when you get to the end of the exam, just 
uh, there's, a, there's a feature there where you can just call up the bookmarks. In other words, it'll, the ones that you skipped over or the ones you bookmark will pop up. You don't have to search through all 80 questions to figure out which ones you answered and didn't answer and stuff. Uh, you can even answer a question and still bookmark it, okay? Uh, the reason I say that is sometimes as you go through the exam, uh, you're not quite sure the answer, you, you put an answer in there, and then you come to another question and go, oh, you know, the light bulb comes on, okay? So that, that also is a nice feature to use when you're taking the exam, it's bookmarking. Uh, Rich said you get two hours for each exam, that's plenty of time, uh, and then you, you get the feedback immediately. You're, you're going to hit a button, it's going to something's going to pop on the screen and says, are you sure you want to submit this? You know, and then you start questioning yourself. No, that, that, all that is, is just a safety check. Okay. So you don't automatically enter uh, something uh, before you're finished. Uh, also, don't skip any answers. You know, it's not like some tests where you get partial credit. If you don't answer a question, a, uh, you know, a missed answer is a wrong answer so when in doubt charlie you know they say charlie out <laughs> yes it was something uh don't leave anything blank okay so um those are just some of the other things i wanted to uh, add on i do have and, and if we have time maybe at the end of the day or if anyone's interested i have um a sample um, it's not it's not CDFM question. This they're made up. They're not from the exam or anything like that. But the, they usually ask about seven different types of questions, and it gives you an idea of the types of question. If anybody's interested, I could I could I could run that. It takes about five minutes or so, kind of show you what this looks like and what to expect when you go in and take the exam. It's voluntary though. And again, if, if you're interested. Okay. Any uh, yes, sir? Yes. Uh, so a lot of exams I've taken like this in the past, what's been helpful for me is taking uh, like practice exams. Do you know if there's a resource like that anywhere? Practice exams, old exams that they've they've expired and you can take that are that do tend to mirror the real test. Uh, the only thing I could tell you, and, and Rich mentioned this this on Monday, they uh, it costs fifty nine bucks, and uh, you they give you access three months. I think it's three months access to study questions. Now, I don't know, uh, neither of us know what these questions look like or who put them together and how representative they are of the actual test questions. But um, I do not know of any, um, you know, old test or anything like that where you can go and look. Uh, and again, the knowledge checks in your book are not representative of the types of questions. What I can show you, as I, as I mentioned before, will kind of give you a hint on how these questions, as I said, they, they usually ask like seven different types of, of questions. And this will give you a uh, kind of a glimpse into the type of question to expect. But I don't know of any uh, like old test or, you know, where you could practice that type of thing, other than that one where you pay for it for 59 bucks. And once again, I, I don't know um, how those look. I've never, I've never seen them. I thought they would. ASMC would allow us instructors to just take a look at them, so we could uh, answer questions like yours. But I, uh, I haven't. I've yet to pay my own fifty-nine bucks just to try it. Does that help? Thank you. Anything else? Anything else about tests or testing? Okay. Hey Dave, I'm sorry. Yeah. Hey, hey good morning. For the, because uh, I'm doing a, a collaboration of both or a combination of both um, mediums. So I'm taking module one in person um, at Pearson View, but module two and three will be at home. Is Pearson View is that CBT based as well, or is that paper and pencil? No, that's uh, that's computer. Yeah, Pearson View is okay. computer. That's one of those places where you're going to go. Uh, you're going to they're going to assign you a locker. And then you'll uh, you put your phone in there, your car keys, everything else, and then you lock it up. Uh, you know, as I said, you're not allowed to take any of that stuff in, in the room with you. They will generally give you a piece of paper and a pencil, 
and that's to work some of the equations that I that I talked about yesterday. Um, and also remember I said uh, when you take your test, you pass it. Make sure you print that screen. Uh, if you have trouble, they all, they always have an administrator watching everybody. And so if you have trouble printing the screen or don't know, you know, where the printers are or anything like that, just kind of flag them down to come and help. But uh, that's immediate feedback one at the Pearson View. As I said, those are those are uh, just testing facilities. You know, they used to call these things Sylvan Learning Centers at one time, and then they went to uh, Prometrics. But they're just the professional testing centers. People go in there, and they will be taking an exam for uh, what is it, a medical exam? It could be a, a blue collar worker type exam, truck trucking exam, whatever. So they they're just professional testing centers. Okay. Uh, paper copies. If you take the paper test, uh, you're not going to get the immediate feedback. They're gonna. That's gonna. That might take a couple of weeks. Okay. Any any other questions? Okay. Uh, let's go on and continue talking about travel. Uh, I didn't want to get into this yesterday. I said there are a lot of questions relating to travel. Um, before we broke yesterday, I talked about a couple of things, vocal orders, so verbal orders of the CO, okay? And I mentioned um, two, two points on, on vocal orders. Uh, you, may, you may not proceed on on travel in anticipation of vocal orders, okay? Um, and also, you cannot be reimbursed based on vocal orders. Uh, they must be reduced to writing. In other words, you must ultimately have a travel order okay, before you can uh, get paid for any of that. <clears throat> so uh, travel is broken into two types. We have temporary duty travel, TDY, and we also have permanent change of station travel, PCS. And the book, uh, it's for years now, it says PCS is referred to as PDT, permanent duty travel. But uh, I think old habits are hard to break. Everybody still calls it PCS, permanent change of station. You know, when one member is moving from one, loca or one location to another, or a civilian is moving from one job to another, or, in another city or state or, or so on. Um, the guiding rules for travel in DOD are published in the JTR. You guys are familiar with that probably, the Joint Travel Regulations. Uh, the, the book, if you have your book, there's a committee that's mentioned here, and I want you to highlight it, and I'll say it for those that don't have a book. It's called the Per Diem Travel and Transportation Allowance Committee. Per Diem Travel and Transportation Allowance Committee. The acronym for that is PDTATAC. It's P-D-T-A-T-A-C. Per Diem Travel and Transportation Allowance Committee. And uh, that's the committee that establishes uh, the travel policy uh, and travel rates and everything for DOD personnel. Well, most, most of the times they just copy it. The other day I talked about GSA, General Services Administration. I said that they establish rates for the federal government. Uh, PD TATAC usually just copies what JTR, I'm sorry, rather uh, GSA puts out. So, but they establish the, uh, the per diem rates for the CONUS states, if you're traveling within CONUS. And that, there's an office that actually does this. This is just a committee. There's an office called the Defense Travel Management Office that uh, they're in charge of, of doing the, doing the, the hands-on work of updating the JTR and, and publishing these. They support the PDTATAC. Uh, the PDTATAC also, if, um, and I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about doubtful travel claims, uh, if they're, um, is a dispute about whether or not this is a, a, the decision of the, the certifying officer about a travel claim. The PDTATAC is 
the, the individual, individual group that will resolve these differences. Okay, they're the final authority on travel in the uh, Department of Defense. And of course, we use, uh, in DOD, we use the DTS system. I talked a little bit about the, its genesis yesterday. Uh, travel orders. Um, you do need to know the form, DD form 1610. Okay, that's, um, there are a couple form numbers you may see on the CDFM exam. So DD form 1610 is our travel, it's the request and authorization for t temporary duty travel for DOD personnel. Okay, that's the, that's our travel authority. Um, so the travel order establishes the conditions for the traveler. So if the, tra if the travel order states you will leave on Tuesday, you'll travel to this location, and you will return on Friday, okay? Um, that's the conditions of travel. Now, um, when we're doing travel orders, we, can somet we sometimes include on there variations authorized. Okay, variations authorized. And uh, variations authorized is included on the order. The traveler is permitted to deviate from the place or places that uh, the, the order states. He could change the days uh, up to a maximum of seven days. And he could even, he or she can even omit a location. Okay, if variation authorized, isn't stated on the order, the traveler must adhere to what's stated on the order. So um, if, you're, if you're on an order and variations authorized is not on there, and uh, but you do need to add another location or extend it another couple of days or what have you, then you have to amend that order. Okay. Now, variations authorized, I know that uh, tends to be put on a lot of orders. It should be the exception rather than the rule, but uh, that's, not, that's not always the case. So if variation authorized is on an order, you may want to write this drop down, the traveler can depart seven days before or after the specified date. Okay. The traveler can, it allows the traveler to depart seven days before or after the specified date and travel can be extended either a hundred percent or seven days whichever is less travel can be extended either a hundred percent or seven days whichever is less so if uh the order is for three days that means he could uh extend it to six days he or she could extend it to six days okay so it's a hundred percent of what the original order said or seven days the lesser of the two. Okay, and as I said, variations authorized uh, should be the exception rather than the rule. Uh, travel claims. So after the completion of the travel, sir, sir, yes, yes. sorry. Um, so what authorizing authority? Are, do they have to explain or account for themselves? I mean, we write a lot of travel orders and it's a very specific amount of days that per diem is, I mean, allowed for and everything. If if the order said said variation authorized, that increases the number per diem days and everything like that. So who's, whose permission is needed to or validate that or who who's verifying that this was an authorized extended for an authorized reason well let's see the individual that's authorizing that's signing the authorized or authorizing the order okay um you can ask them you know a traveler wants to go on or says he needs he or she needs to go on travel someone authorizes that travel uh so that's the person that's making the determination that um that addition that flexibility is needed it, it again, it's how you're how you're structured there, but uh, yeah, it's, it should be the individual that's authorizing this.
Okay. Copy. Thank you. Now, you know, again, I know that this has become, as I said, it's almost become uh, the, the the norm to put uh, variations authorized. Uh, it depends. The this goes back to how your organization. Uh, how, how strict they are with some of the policies and the use of money. If money's tight and things like that, uh, you may want to, someone needs to raise the issue, hey, we can't afford all this flexibility. Again, but there, there, may, there, there are always reasons to have this flexibility. And uh, so, you know, I know that the airlines now and then, the, the way that the way things are, they're always changing flights, but uh, and, and delaying flights and so on. But that's where you get into look, we have to amend it because things were out of my control. You know, airlines uh, didn't take off when they, <laughs> I, I planned on taking off, and they didn't get me back when I planned on getting back. So that would be that would require an amendment. Okay, uh, travel claims. <clears throat> so after the completion of travel or every 30 days for extended travel. Yesterday I was telling you about how we, uh, during Hurricane Katrina, everybody in our organization, all the military, the civilians, and you know, family members, we were on travel for six months. We were under orders for six months because our building and everyone, all the family housing and the, most of the employees' homes were was underwater. And so, um, you know, government was really good. The Navy uh, really took care of its people and uh, they put everybody on orders and stayed in hotels. I stayed in a hotel for six months. Uh, but to get, you know, to, to claim reimbursement, uh, you had filed claims every 30 days to get reimbursed. You didn't wait till the end of the six months. So everyone uh, had to file claims every 30 days. And uh, so you use this travel voucher form. And here's another form you need to write down, the DD form 1351-2. That's your travel voucher form. <clears throat> well, that's where you're going to claim to get reimbursed. Okay, uh, I want to talk about uh, questionable and doubtful travel claims. Okay. Um, a questionable travel claims or where the certifying officer believes to uh, be illegal or improper. So the certifying officer, the person certifying this for payment, he's gonna look at the, the claim and start questioning uh, some of the charges. And I've seen these things before uh, when I was certifying vouchers. Again, during, uh, during Katrina, everybody was told to go to your designated safe place. I mean, I said they were, that was either in Fort Worth, we were down in New Orleans, so that was either Fort Worth or Millington. So when people started filing claims, um, I was getting claims for four new tires for my car because my car, you know, not this is not me, this is someone claiming this. Uh, they said, well, I wasn't ready to travel four or 500 miles. My tires were kind of shot, so I'm putting in a claim, I had to go get four new tires to put on the car. Now, <laughs> sorry, that's not a, that's not a legitimate travel expense. Okay. Those, so we call those things questionable travel claims. And that's where the certifying officer questions um, what's been placed on the order. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and it goes on to say in the book, if the amount is less than $250, uh, the CEO or the certifying officer can request an advanced decision from the general counsel. Okay. But uh, requests for amounts over $250 require advanced decisions from the DOD uh, hearings and appeal board. Now, doubtful travel claims are those in which the traveler questions the decision of the certifying officer. And so, uh, if again, if there's a, you're getting your claim back and you say, hey, why didn't you pay me for this or that? Okay, uh, then you're, that, that is what's called a doubtful travel claim. Uh, 
if these things cannot be resolved, they then get forwarded to that group called PD TATAC for final resolution. They will give you the final decision. They make they're the, the ultimate authority for uh, doubtful travel claims. Okay, I'm going to talk about one other thing here. Uh, this is not in the book. Um, if you are on travel and you uh, you know you're sitting in the lobby of Reagan National Air or, or not Reagan, if you're sitting in the lobby of uh, down in Atlanta or somewhere, and uh, the airline bumps you. Okay, you're not volunteering. You're 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 getting bumped. And they said, uh, we know your flight's supposed to take off today. Uh, we'll, we'll put you on the plane first thing tomorrow morning. Okay. If you are involved, but, but they go on to say, we're going to give you a ticket for travel. We're going to give you a voucher for a free trip. If, so if you are in, we call that being involuntarily bumped. Okay. It wasn't your choice. You didn't raise your hand. So if you are involuntarily bumped, the government owns that ticket, not you, okay? If you are involuntarily bumped by the airlines, the government owns that ticket. However, if you're sitting in that same lobby say, down in Atlanta and they go, uh, we're, you know, they come on the speaker and say, we are overbooked. And does anybody wanna give up their seat tonight? And uh, we'll put you on the first plane tomorrow morning and we'll give you a free ticket. Uh, you own that ticket. That is your ticket. However, all those extra costs you're going to incur between uh, you know having to stay in a hotel and the extra day of per diem, those are not the government's. Those are yours. Those are your costs. Okay. So that's the logic here. If you are involuntarily bumped, the government owns the ticket because things were out of your control. Okay, you would, so you would then be entitled to, you know, more PDM and, you know, maybe another light of, night of lodging. Maybe, the, maybe they'll, they'll put you up for the, because they feel sorry for you. But um, if, you're, if you're voluntarily bumped, if you bump yourself, you get the ticket, but those additional expenses are yours. So may, you may say a question on, on at that point. Sir, okay. yes. I had a question about the doubtful travel claim situation. So, if they don't pay something, does that mean it? Like to become a doubtful cl travel claim, it sounds like the certifying officer has to have not paid something that you put in there. Yeah. Does that mean every doubtful travel claim was also a questionable travel claim because they chose not to? They didn't think something was a an authorized charge. Uh, maybe. You know, um, well, it could be too, yeah, authorized. It could be, you know, I'd say questionable is where the certifying officer believes it's illegal or improper. Um, you know, you're going there and uh, they're sending you to a meeting and you, um, you, you want to look your best, so you go get a haircut. Okay, I'm going to get a haircut and a, a facial uh, because I want to look the best at the meeting or when I represent the, co <laughs> the command. Uh, Certifying offer is going to look at that and go, hey, I'm, I'm not paying for your haircut. That's your, that's your responsibility. Okay. Yeah, it, it, they are somewhat similar. Okay. Uh, but I'd say the doubtful is where the, uh, the traveler questions the certifying office. So they could be, the, you know, one and the same. Right. I, that's what I'm trying to, yeah. to tease out in my mind is yeah. can, if this, can the certifying officer just choose not to pay things or, I mean, if the, it, the only reason the certifying officer would not pay something is if it's a doubtful claim, correct? Yeah. If it's a, yeah. Uh, and they may view it, uh, again, as uh, one says, either illegal or it wasn't part of the, uh, part of your official travel. Shouldn't be part oh. of the, you know, you put in, um, you know, they lose, uh, they, they, they displace your luggage or something like that, and you uh, you go out and uh, I went out and bought a new suit because I had to have a suit and stuff. But you did get your luggage later on, that type of thing. Uh, yeah, so it could be one and the same. 
So I guess what I'm asking is, is there a situation where you would have a doubtful travel claim that wasn't already a questionable travel claim? Because by by definition for the doubtful travel claim, there has to be something the certifying officer didn't pay. And if the certifying officer didn't pay it, doesn't that mean it was a questionable travel claim? Is there well, any way? It could be situations also where uh, he is interpreting, you know, the, the certifying officer is interpreting something more strictly. Uh, remember I was talking about just about the guy that was questioning everything and uh, they, he really feels that it is a valid issue. It's a valid claim. Uh, certifying officer doesn't doesn't agree with that. And uh, again, the doubtful claims then it may, you need a third party to adjudicate it and stuff. And so that's where it could get bumped up to the PD Tech. You know, it becomes a, a, a battle of wills. He may view it. The certifying officer may view it. It may be a legitimate claim. He just doesn't he doesn't see it that way. Copy. Thank you. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, something again that is not in your book. Uh, invitational travel orders, ITOs. Okay, um, we use ITOs for official travel for people that are not necessarily government or federal government employees. Okay. Um, so if we have people coming in to give a presentation sometimes, sometimes we use these for job applicants. So I'm going to give you a um, thing to write down. Okay. Let me see a question on invitational travel orders. So ITOs may be issued to job applicants. Okay, this is someone that uh, you're calling someone in from maybe outside the area and you're going to put them on, you know, give them, maybe they're, maybe they're in another city, another state, uh, and you're having trouble finding a qualified individual anywhere near your area. So you could fly someone in. Okay. And they're not, they're maybe not necessarily a guy yet. Uh, so ITOs may be issued to job applicants. Uh, they can be issued to individuals presenting awards. You want someone coming in to present an award, you know, some uh, uh, high-ranking individual. Uh, you could do ITOs for ask, ask someone to come in and give a speech. Uh, but put this down. ITOs may not be issued to, to NAF personnel, NAF, not appropriate fund personnel. This is one of those not questions you may see on your, on the exam. So they may be issued for, for job applicants, individuals presenting an award, uh, someone giving a speech, but not to NAP personnel. <clears throat> okay, uh, I want to talk about PCS travel now. And again, permanent duty travel, that's their new term for it. Normally, uh, so when we're doing PCS, and I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe some of you have experience with this, uh, you know, for civilians, uh, when the government pays uh, for, to put it, they advertise a, for a job, and there's no one in the immediate area located or available for this job, sometimes they have to go nationwide and advertise for this job. And so um, when you when they advertise for a job, unless you say something on the, the this job advertisement that PCS will not be authorized, it's assumed that it will be, okay? So um, right. in your book, and let me say this, all costs associated with a civilian PCS move are normally charged to the appropriation of the gaming activity. Okay, so if you're advertising, uh, you're bringing someone in from an outside source, outside city, uh, you are the gaining activity, you have to pay for those PCS costs. PCS moves can be really expensive. They could be $50,000, $75,000, $100,000 because you're paying to put that person uh, on travel and 
his family comes with him and you pay for them and they're, they're on per diem for a certain length of time and you pay for the shipment of their household goods and all that stuff. They can be pretty expensive. Okay. So uh, normally all costs associated with a civilian PCS move are charged to the appropriation of the gaining activity. Now there are exceptions and generally CDFM questions, they talk about the exceptions. Okay, so uh, if it's between uh, agencies or between DOD components, then uh, like, like a, if there's a reduction in force or a transfer of function, or if someone is moving under the priority placement program. Priority placement program is one of those programs in DOD where if they close an organization, they put people on uh, like the stopper list. And uh, you have to, and if you're advertising for a job and they fit those qualifications, then you have to hire that, bring that person on board, okay? So if there's PCS cost involved with those types of things, the losing activity pays, okay? If it's a reduction in force or a, a transfer of functions or movement under a DOD priority placement program, the losing activity pays. That shouldn't, think about that. That shouldn't be something that I'm forced to pay because uh, I'm, I'm being told I have to take this person on board. So that's one scenario. Uh, the other scenario is if, um, and this is from within the same DOD component. So if this is be like within Navy, if there are rifts, uh, BRAC moves, or someone is moving from OCONUS to CONUS. So they're overseas and now they're coming back to the States, the losing activity pays. So a lot of times um, organizations, uh, OCONUS organizations will hire folks from the States to come over and work, uh, you know, work over in Naples, Italy or something for a couple of years. Uh, and if that's the case, let's say Naval Support Activity Naples is hiring and they bring someone from the States, they pay for that move and then the move from the state to Naples, Italy. And on the back end, you know, those people might be there for three years or so. They have, they have to come, they have to return to their, uh, like their former job or a job. Then uh, Naples, Naval Support Activity Naples, pays to send them back. That's one of the, if you work overseas, that's one of those things they budget for. They, they budget for those costs, okay? So it's, if it's moving from OCONUS back to CONUS, uh, the losing activity pays. Are there limitations on that? I mean, if you moved over there under a, you're gonna come work for us for two or three years or whatever, and they get there six months later and say, hey, yeah, this isn't for me, I wanna go back home. Do they incur that expense then because they didn't meet like the terms of how long they were going to work there? Or? Sometimes people get extended over there, but they still pay for it. Yeah. As I said, they budget for those expenses. Now, if you just choose you're going to live over there for a while and you're not going to work for them anymore, um, then then you're kind of on your own. But. Uh, so I meant if the individual wants to come home early, like they were supposed to be there for three years and after six months overseas, they're like, no, I, I'm going, I oh, want to go, uh, I quit, I'm out. Well, yeah, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I mean, I think they still pay for them to come back. Uh, there might be other issues involved in something like that too. They said, oh. hey, you, you hired on for three years or you're here for three years. Uh, and in the meantime, someone else is, filling your job back home. So there may be other, uh, not, not you don't always return to the same job. Uh, you, they have to, I've known people that have worked in Norfolk, they went over and uh, worked in London for a couple of years. And when they wanted to go back to Norfolk, that job had either been disestablished or uh, someone else was filling that job. So they, they may have to say, we got a job for you, but it's not in Norfolk. They do, you do have return rights, but uh, I, I guess it's all depends how your con, you know, the contract you uh, agreed to when you made that move. Okay.
okay, that's travel. I, as I mentioned, there's a lot of a lot of questions uh, related to travel on the exam. <clears throat> Okay, let's talk about payments to vendors now. Uh, and we'll talk about a couple things here, advanced payments, payment package, special conditions, and prompt payments. And we're gonna have to walk through a couple of these things. Um, I'll walk you through a prompt payment exercise. Uh, you will get asked a question on computing prompt payment due date on the CDFM exam. I'm, I'm telling you that right now. So. Uh, so we'll walk through on how to compute that. I know a lot of that is done uh, automatically these days, but you do need to know uh, what to consider. Um, <clears throat> so advanced payments. So you know, Rich, yesterday Rich was talking about the Red Book. So Chapter Five in the Red Book says that no advanced payments, okay, will be made. And then after it says that, it goes on and gives about thirteen exceptions, <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, they, they are made and stuff like that. Um, uh, so title, there's a, there's a section in Title 31 that prohibits uh, advanced payments, but we're, we're gonna talk about that. So advanced payments can be made, as I said, there's like 13 exceptions to advanced payments. Uh, they can be made, um, if let's say we're overseas and we have rent in foreign countries, Okay, advance payments are authorized. If we have to pay utility bills and they want money in advance, a lot of times we have to uh, adhere to whatever uh, the, we need to be in compliance with whatever the foreign law, laws are in uh, that part of the world. So um, they are authorized uh, by DOD if we need to be in compliance with these laws. And again, these things can be for, for rent in, in cities, utilities. Uh, necessary supplies and stuff like that. Uh, overseas countries, they um, you know they like dealing with the government, but also they can uh, have their own demands. So we have to be sensitive to those demands. Um, talk about the um, so contractors can re request advance payments, okay, and they can be made. However, there's a couple of the uh, stipulations here and it's in your book and you may i'll read them so some others can write them down advanced payments can be made to a contractor uh number one the contractor has to give adequate security i want to write that down the contractor has to give adequate security uh number two that the advanced payment is uh in the best interest or facilitates national defense. So it's in the uh, in best public interest or it facilitates national defense. And number three, the advance is limited to no more than the unpaid contract price. Okay. The advance is limited to no more than the unpaid contract price. So advance payments can be made to a contractor if the contractor gives adequate security it's determined that it's in the public interest or it facilitates national defense and that the advance is limited to no more than the unpaid contract price. Okay, uh, talk about payments to vendors now. Uh, Yesterday, I was talking about the entitlement process, and you know, I said the entitlement process had four parts. Uh, the entitling piece, which was make, you know, making sure that a law exists. Uh, the authorization piece, which is where someone is uh, authorizing uh, the use or that, that particular entitlement. And then the next piece was the voucher preparation piece. So we're gonna talk about the voucher preparation piece. So uh, before a dispersing officer is going to make a payment, he requires what is called a payment package. Okay, before the DO makes a payment, he requires a payment package. And uh, so this is where the certifying officer, they have to admit, ensure uh, this 
what's on this payment package is correct. So uh, certifying offers have to ensure that there's a legal obligation to pay, okay? In other words, there have to be a contract. We've had to have agreed in a contract somewhere. Um, the certifying officer has to make sure that the provider has met the terms of the contract, okay? In other words, there, there's been an acceptance. Uh, the certifying officer also has to make sure that the payment and the payee are correct. So remember we talked about uh, calculations and everything, that has to be correct. We're paying the right amount and that uh, we're paying the right person. So the amount of the payment and the payee is correct. And finally, that the, uh, the appropriation we're getting ready to use, the payment is made under you know, legal terms, purpose, time, and amount. We're using the right monies, okay? So as I said yesterday, no, nothing gets paid unless it's been certified, okay? So the certifying officer is the last line of defense, if you will. So uh, for to have a proper payment package, well, we have to have a first, a copy of the purchase order okay we have to have that contract and that's the thing that has the terms of the contract and the funds that were obligated to pay for that contract um the second part of that and those of you that don't have a book we have to have what is called a proper invoice from the contractor <clears throat> now a proper invoice to be a proper invoice there's 10 items uh, that must be included. If you have a book, you can look at these 10 items. You don't need to memorize the 10 items. Let me give you a little tip on uh, a type of question you may receive. Uh, but the 10 items are, it's got to have the name of the contractor. It's got to have the invoice date. You don't need to write these down. It's got to have the contract number, uh, voice number, uh, description, quantity of what we're buying, shipping and payment terms, uh, the taxpayer identification number, the TIN number for the vendor. It's got to have banking information, uh, the contractor's name, title, and then uh, any other documentation required by the contract. Uh, so certifying, again, don't, don't try to memorize those things. There's way too many, but there's 10 items that make up a, a proper invoice. If any if, if the certifying officer gets this and there if any of those items are missing, you might want to write this down. This is what is called a defective invoice. It's a defective invoice. And it's got to be returned. It's got to be returned. We got to have all make sure we have all 10 items. Now you may see a CDFM question, and they're going to ask you which is not part of a proper invoice. And you may want to write this down. The proper invoice does not contain the line of accounting. Okay, the contractor doesn't know or doesn't need to know your line of accounting. That's not part of the proper invoice. So um, you may see a question. It may list out some of these things that are on a proper invoice. The line of accounting is not one of them. Uh, so that's a that's a proper invoice, and then also uh, they have to show receipt and acceptance. Okay, Re make sure uh, product's been received. Well, these could be receiving reports or whatever, and then someone has accepted that. Uh, we use things like a DD form two hundred and fifty, a material inspection and receiving report. Those can serve those can serve both as a uh, as an invoice and a material acceptance documents. Okay. Um, we also use DD forms 1155s, orders for supplies or services. Both of these can be used as receiving reports, but we have to show that someone has received it and accepted. Okay. So all those things are part of what we call a proper invoice. And uh, so I would like draw you know highlight that whole slide you need to know those four parts it's a great place for a not type question and then make sure you've noted some of the things i talked about on on this page
Uh, payments to vendors. A um, couple things here, um, special conditions. Talked about some of this, I mentioned, we mentioned this the other day, fast pay, pay and confirm. Uh, fast pay, the, uh, fast pay is where, um, this is something that we, we sometimes use uh, on, on uh, contracts. And uh, what fast pay is, is where the contractor, uh, based on delivery of the, of the, sh the shipping document and before re receipt and acceptance, this is where the contractor, uh, we can make payments before the contractor, uh, and before the, um, rather, I'm sorry, rather before the government goes through receipt and acceptance, okay? So uh, this is, these are the special conditions which allow contractors to put, to be paid before receipt and acceptance. Um, the contractor in these cases, on your fast pay, the contractor um, serves as the accepting organization. Now, ultimately, the government has to come back and provide notice of receipt and acceptance. But um, we use this sometimes when uh, we're in a hurry. So um, the contractor certifies that goods and services have been received. Uh, as I said, the government must ultimately certify. Uh, so this is written into the contract. This is, this is authorized by the contracting officer when the contract is being written. Uh, there's usually a couple conditions here. We try to limit these to no more than these types of contracts to no more than $30,000. And also we, we, what we like to or try to do is uh, limit these to uh, vendors, to contractors that, that we've had dealt with before. What you don't wanna do is uh, do this for a contractor where you're entering into agreement for the first time, okay? And so uh, this contractors usually have good, uh, good records. And so um, these are, you, you could enter into a fast pay with those types of folks. Um, it's not recommended, as I said, for one-time contracts. Uh, pay and confirm, uh, fast pay, they're pretty much the same, okay? Fast pay is an example of pay and confirm. Rich mentioned yesterday we had used to have, we used to call it pay and chase. But these are, these are special conditions. It allows us to uh, allow vendors to get paid quicker than normal and uh, they can do the receipt and acceptance. Government ultimately has to come back and uh, do that. Other thing I want to talk about here is called- What's the advantage to the government doing this? I mean, I see the advantage to the vendor, but what what, what advantage does the government get out of these arrangements? Uh, it's, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess if we, need something in a hurry and stuff. And, uh, you know, we, we, we've been dealing with this guy a long time. It just expedites the process. If a vendor has good standing, it expedites the process. We need things in a hurry. And again, it might just be one of the conditions that's written into the contract. Copy, thank you. Yeah. Uh, constructive acceptance. And we're going to be talking about this term constructive acceptance when we get into uh, prompt pay. Um, constructive acceptance takes place uh, seven days. What you do is when, when goods or services have been received, uh, you add seven calendar date days to the delivery date. Okay. And uh, what the purpose of constructive acceptance is that it, it forces the government to uh, go out and test and accept these items, okay? You'll see how this plays when we work through a prompt payment exercise. But constructive acceptance is like much like a forcing factor. It forces the government to uh, go in and test and accept what has been delivered, okay? 
So we look at the delivery date, and then we add seven calendar days to that. I'll show you when we get into prompt pay, which is the next section here. <clears throat> Okay, uh, prompt payment. And uh, there was a law passed in uh, back, way back in 82, it was public law 97-117. And um, this is what was called the Prompt Payment Act, okay? Prior to 1982, and I, and I was working back at that time, uh, if you got, invoices in from vendors, okay? You, um, here's what you did. You looked at those that were offering a discount and if they offered a discount, in other words, if they, if you paid them sooner than, uh, you know, within 10 days of uh, receipt, uh, they'll give you a discount. They'll give you a 1%, 2% discount on the items. So you'd look at, uh, you'd look at all your invoices, the ones that were offering discounts, you would, Try to pay those first, right? That, that saves you some money. The others you put in the corner of your desk and you got around to paying them whenever you had time, okay? Uh, <clears throat> I had a brother, or I have a, I have a brother and he was very big into uh, microchips and he used to run one of the largest companies in North America. He was the CEO of one of the largest companies in North America that produced microchips, okay? And, uh, talking to him one time and I go, do you do a lot of government work? And he goes, uh, this was prior to 1982. He goes, no, I hate working with the government. I go, why? I go, I work for the government. And he goes, uh, because they never pay me. They never pay me. It's hard to get paid on time. And he goes, you know, I'm, I'm incurring costs and uh, they pay me, I got, I got, it's like pulling teeth getting the government to pay me. Uh, well, he wasn't alone. He wasn't alone. Uh, think about this. You you know you look at the like a, a battle group out of they're getting ready to deploy out of Norfolk. They're going on a you know six month nine month tour or wherever, and you know they're loading up. You know you got the carriers loading up and everybody else loading up. They're buying supplies, everything else, uh, and some of these you know they're working with some of the local vendors getting getting everything they need for this for this tour. And uh, as they're taking off from Norfolk, they're looking back at the folks on land and they say, hey, look, they're waving at us. And they go, uh, they're, they're telling them they're waving us goodbye. And the, the folks on the pier are saying, they're waving their hands, they're saying, hey, you forgot to pay me. You know, uh, <clears throat> this became a real issue for companies prior to 1982. And, um, they, you know, companies, they, they had costs, they got, they got, bills to pay they got people to pay they got to replenish their inventory and when they were having to wait for they want to do business with the government uh but then they also want to get paid on time so um people started lobbying congress and uh that's what you know kind of the genesis of this law and uh you know G then they sent gao out to do a study on this and gao their study revealed pretty much the same thing uh, that basically that there was no uniform criteria for determining pay dates. And this was not just DOD, this was the whole federal government. Uh, they also found out that many invoices were paid either too early or too late. And about 30% uh, of all the invoices were paid way after the, the due date, costing vendors millions of dollars and stuff. You know, some people were and almost in bankruptcy because they couldn't get paid from the government. <clears throat> so Congress, you know, uh, they wrote, as, as Rip said, Congress is reactive. And so what they did is they, they wrote the Prompt Payment Act. And the Prompt Payment Act doesn't say you have to pay your bills on time. It just says um, you'll, you'll pay, have to pay interest uh, when they're late. So it says, also goes on to say, you should take discounts when they're economically justified, okay? It recommends paying bills on time, but uh, doesn't mandate that. And so you pay interest when late and you take discounts when they're economically justified. Okay. So we're gonna look through a, uh, I told you on your exam, you're going to have to compute prompt payment due date. 
So uh, let's look at how that's done. It's a simple way. I, I, I realize that a lot of this is done uh, automatically these days. So when you're looking at computing the prompt payment due date, you look at this chart here, it says step one. Uh, the first thing you look at is um, the days, the day the goods or services were received. Okay, that's your starting point for this. So something shows up on the loading dock on a certain day. What you then need to do, you take that day that goods and services are received, and you add seven days to that, seven calendar days. That's that thing we call constructive acceptance. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, constructive acceptance is uh, it's a forcing factor. It will force you to someone to go down and do a uh, receipt and acceptance. Okay. So you take that date, you add seven days to it, and you come up with a new date. Step two. You compare that new date with the actual date of acceptance. Okay. Uh, if it's earlier, then you use the earlier date. If it's later, then you use that constructive acceptance date. Okay. You take the earlier of the two. So you compare the date of actual acceptance with the date of the constructive acceptance. You take the earlier of those two days. The day you get out of that, you compare them with the date that the invoice was received. Okay. okay. You then take the latter of the two. It gives you a whole new date. Add 30 days to that, and that is your prompt payment due date. And I'll show you how I'll show you an example of this. Anything after that prompt payment due date, you start. Uh, incurring interest. So let's let's use that example here. So it says um, the goods and services came in on June first. Okay, they, they showed up on the loading dock on June first. <clears throat> uh, in the meantime, someone went down there. Uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, they were accepted on June sixth. And then your invoice was received on June 3rd. Okay. So step one, you take the date that the goods and services were received, June 1st, add seven days to that. That's your constructive acceptance day. So it gives you June 8th. Step two, you compare that with uh, the date that they were actually accepted. So um, Couple of days uh, earlier, someone went down, they looked at everything, they counted the widgets, and they accepted it. So in this case, we use that at day, the earlier. We use the earlier of those two. We use June 6th. Then you compare that day with the day the invoice was received, June 3rd. Take the latter of the two, add 30 days, and you get July 6th. Okay, that anything after July 6th, you start accruing, that's your prompt payment due date. Anything after that, interest is due. Now, what you need to know and remember, uh, if you may get something on your test, you may get one of those months with uh, 31 days in it or 28 days in it and stuff. So you gotta make, kind of make sure you know what days, uh, how many days are in what month, you know, 30 days has September, June and November, you know, know that little rhyme or whatever, but you got to know what months have 30 days and what months have 31 days. So here's a little graphic on that whole thing. Okay. So those are, uh, those are the dates that we just played with here. Uh, date of the invoice was 6-3, date of items received was June 1st actual acceptance date was June 6th. So I take the date they showed up on the loading dock, add seven days, that gives me my constructive acceptance date. Okay, I compare that constructive acceptance date 
with the actual acceptance date. I take the earlier of the two. I then compare that date with the date of the, the invoice rec received. I take the latter of the two. Okay, that was, I, I take the latter of the two, which is June 6th. And 30 days. And that gives me, gives me uh, July 7th. Okay. Now, so you will see a test question on that. Um, again, that might be one of those things. Uh, just remember the three key dates there, or the three key items of date inverse items received, acceptance date, and actual or constructive acceptance, and then the actual, okay. Remember, just draw that out on your piece of paper and pencil as you enter the room. But you will you will get a you will get a prompt payment question. Um, discounts. Sometimes you may see something like um, on a on a invoice. It may say something like two, and then have a slash, and then it'll say ten, and then it'll go on to say net thirty, two ten net thirty. What is how do you read that? How do you interpret that? That means what that means is. Uh, the vendor is offering you a dis a two percent discount if he is paid within ten days. Otherwise, everything's due. The net is due in thirty days. Okay, you may see one ten net thirty, two ten net thirty. Okay, uh, so that first digit would be the discount they're offering. Again, if you pay them within thirty days, if you're doing discounts, if you if you get a discount question. You do not use the, what you use is the vendor's invoice date, okay? Not the date that the invoice is received. You use the vendor's invoice date, which will probably, probably be different. You use that as your starting point, okay? So if your vendor's invoice date is July 17th and it says something like 210 net 30, then uh, if you pay them before July 27th, you can take that 2% uh, discount. Now, uh, you know, I said, I realize that DFAS, this is all done for us by DFAS in an automated way. Remember the prompt payment act says, take discounts when they're economically justified. So they have, they have systems that are actually linked to the Treasury Department, and uh, those systems actually make the determination of uh, whether or not they're economically justified. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later on, but you know, the Treasury um, they they don't keep a lot of cash on hand. Uh, if you look at the the, the federal government, uh, the, the you know the Treasury, they only keep several days worth of cash on hand at any point in time. Okay, and um, they're always moving money around. They are they are really good at uh, you know money management and stuff. And so uh, you know if we're getting a discount and they deem it's not economically justified because we got to go out and borrow money from China and pay them a higher interest rate, those types of things, um, then it's, it's not going to be worth our while to to claim that. So that's why I'm saying that, you know, this, the system that DFAS has that's linked to Treasury, it's going to kind of make the determination whether or not something is economically justified. Okay. Uh, now, I'll give you a couple notes and then we'll, we'll take a little break here. Uh, if you have a contract that's in dispute, you do not pay interest. You do not pay, pay interest on that if there's a contract dispute. Um, and we do not pay uh, prompt payment on classified projects, okay? Classified projects, if there's invoices related to those prompt payment rules are not, uh, do not apply. Uh, let's see. 
Okay. Uh, that's a good place to break. Um, let's, I got almost quarter after, let's come back at 25 after the hour. Let's take a 10 minute break, come back at 25 after the hour, and we'll continue on.